Hi, um, I'm Alan. I'm a junior consultant at Agape Red, and tonight I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about some of the new features that are being introduced in ECMAS 6. So ECMAS 6 is a strict superset of ECMAS 5. You don't have to worry about anything breaking. However, um, unlike ECMAS 5, uh, the jump from 3 to 5 wasn't really a big deal. Uh, mainly, there were just some new functions added. There were some things cleared up about scope, but browsers weren't really implementing those anyway. So um, it didn't really matter. ECMAS 6 adds a lot of new syntax, um, so there's kind of some gotchas uh, involved here. So scope in JavaScript was already kind of confusing. Um, I have a few examples here that were difficult for me to work out. Uh, basically, it's scoped uh, per function. So you only have scoping in functions. And then there's certain types of declarations of variables that end up having a higher precedence than others. The most notable of which is the function keyword. If you use a function not as a lambda function, but as a declaration, it ends up having the highest order of precedence and can cause things to be scoped strangely um, if you aren't expecting it. Uh, one way that, uh, oh, and also, another thing uh, that gets me actually quite frequently is I get lured into a false sense of security by curly braces and for loops, and I think when I'm attaching functions inside of my for loop to items in the DOM, that later when I click that, I'm going to have the right variable there, but actually um, it ends up being the wrong thing. Uh, it ends up being one greater than the last element in the list, so something to watch out for. This can be easily fixed with the new let keyword. So basically, it does exactly what you would expect. It's a replacement for bar. It augments the existing notation. And it allows a variable to be scoped only to the scope of the curly braces, or in the case of the for loop, it includes what's in the parentheses, too. Um, akin to let is const. Const functions the exact same way as let, except it uh, makes it constant. Shocker. Um, you can try to change constants. Uh, it won't work. It will silently fail unless you're in strict mode, in which case you'll get a type error exception. Um, a really exciting feature is the new shorthand for creating functions called arrow functions. Basically, you take the arguments, put them in parentheses, put an arrow, followed by a block, and bam, it's a lambda, just like that. Uh, so you can see there, that's now what you can do to quickly create a function. Um, and then you can omit the parentheses around the parameters, uh, if you so choose, as long as it's not, I don't know, the, the order of operations is it, at the highest. Um, at the top part with the exception of the curly braces. So you can use it pretty much anywhere without the parentheses, and as long as you aren't relying on an automatic semicolon insertion, you should be fine. Um, string interpolation, another one of those sugar things. So pretty self-explanatory, it uses the back tick. So the back tick, the dollar sign, curly brace, and bam, the expression is inserted into the string automatically. Um, so people, well, I shouldn't say people in general, I've had someone complain to me that JavaScript isn't really object-oriented. We are all here. We all here know that it's prototypally um, object-oriented. However, for those who prefer the classical style, they are augmenting that to now include classical inheritance. So pretty self-explanatory. The class keyword declares a class. You can have an optional extension. Uh, there's the constructor function, which initializes it, and then you can see down there that um, increment age creates a function, and then that's actually a getter. So although that looks like a function declaration, that get keyword makes it so that you access that as like a, a property, and it evaluates that function instead. And here's what's going on behind the scenes. It has a direct, it's just it's just sugar. It has a direct relationship to prototypal inheritance. You don't have to worry about that um, screwing anything up. That's all it's doing in the background. Now, you're probably wondering where the private members are, and I was too. Um, it turns out that they aren't going to have them. Instead, we get these really odd things called symbols. Um, I have mixed feelings about them, in case you haven't noticed. Basically, a symbol is just a special literal that can be used as a key in an object. The thing that makes it super special, though, is that you can't get it back. So if you do like object.keys and pass on an object, it might have a symbol as a key. There's no way to retrieve that symbol. So it allows you to store a value in an object that goes outside of your control and make it so that no one else, unless they have access a reference to your original symbol, can get that value back. Um, it can also have an optional description. All that does is on two string gives you that description back so you can remember what that symbol was supposed to represent. And so that can be used to create private numbers and properties um, on objects. Uh, so the self-invoking lambda function is a very, you know, it's a very common pattern in JavaScript. So common, in fact, that they're adding new notation for it. So in comes models. So models start with a model keyword, and then the thing that makes a model a model that's really cool is that those curly braces actually have their own global scope, kind of. So basically the way that works is, is that they receive the original global scope, but anything that extended that global scope by other code, they don't get, and if they extend it, no one else can see. So um, 
really cool. So it's kind of like they get an, uh, you know, a pure view of the global scope. Um, and then later in code, you can import it. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. You import whatever the export was named and then whatever you want it to be called in your scope. So in this case, it exported student. I'm getting it in my scope um, via a let declaration, by the way, as an amazing student from um, that student uh, string literal representation, which in future implementations will probably end up being a path to the vial because that makes the most sense. Um, and then there's, there's a variety of ways that you can do those import statements. You can import some things or um, not others, or you can have default imports, which means you basically get to shorthand it. You can be like, import you know, this, and if it has a default export, it'll, it'll assume that you have the default export. So you don't have to worry about, um, you don't have to worry about that. Um, destructive assignment, another really cool piece of sugar syntax. So basically, um, that flips the two variables. It works you know, like that. So kind of on the internal workings, if you wanted to omit a given parameter, you just leave it out, and it does work from left to right. So if you have some extra ones on the end, they get ignored. Um, akin to that is the spread operator. So what would have required a connotation, that's actually going to, so where you see that dot, 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 A is going to place the array at that position. So B now augments array by nine. Um, and C, yeah, uh, the, it's greedy. So when you put that in there, it's going to try to fill up as much as it can with A and keep going. So you can use multiple spread operators inside of one declaration. It can also be used inside of function declarations and invocations. And actually, um, in the latest specification I read in September, they're deprecating the arguments array, pseudo array thing altogether. So it looks like this is going to be the new way to get arguments, um, the correct way at least, to get arguments um, as arrays. So that's kind of how that works. Another really exciting feature is iterators and iterables. Iterables are pretty simple. They're basically just objects that have a key that's a function. Um, and that key's name is next, and then next is bound to the object. And that object should represent the internal state of the iteration. Next does whatever it wants to that object so it knows its place. And then, um, another, and then when you try to use that object to iterate over it, that next function is called repeatedly um, until you throw a stop iteration exception from inside of the next function. So that's really complicated. Luckily, they're, they're simplifying this a little bit, and they're putting in generating functions. So what makes the function a generating function is evidently a star after the function keyword and a yield statement somewhere inside of it. Um, pretty much the exact same thing, except a yield statement will return, but later when that function is invoked, it will pick up right where it left off. So those two code statements are equivalent. One's just a lot shorter and easier to read. Highly recommend generating. Um, and where you can use these is in for up loops. So just like for in, except you get to use your own little custom um, iterator. Which, by the way, every object will have a default iterator. The default iterator will have the same behavior as the for in, except it will not go up the prototype chain. So it'll iterate over the properties of only that object. Um, another really nifty thing is the proxy objects. This is honestly, I'm not going to lie, this is probably the most exciting piece. So the proxy objects um, allow you to, so basically it creates a new object that wraps around another object, but allows you to intercept, um, they call it traps, allows you to intercept certain events. So in this case, this one intercepts the get event. So every time you try to get something, or I'm sorry, the set event, every time you try to set something on the proxy object, um, it executes that little piece of code. Um, a little note, well, never mind, I won't even talk about that. Okay, so akin to proxies is observers. They're basically the same thing, except a proxy is completely distinct from the original object. It creates kind of a new object that, if you don't trap certain things, pass through to the original object. Whereas the observer um, is, uh, it hooks into the original object. So as its name might suggest, you can't trap certain things. So observers can only track changes to properties. So you can't on an observer, you can track a set, because that's a change to the object, but you can't track a get, because that's not a change. You can track a delete, you can track like um, a, a set, I don't know, if you set a property that already existed, obviously that would be tracked. So, I think this is the easier one of the two, but with the proxy one, you get to do things like method missing, because you can check if the property's there or not, and if it's not, you can do something special. Um, and so, those are a few of my favorite features. Uh, to put some of the code samples together, I found out just like just how much disarray there was surrounding ECMA 6. So some of them were executed in V8, some of them were executed through an online thing called Continuum, and still others were executed through a thing called Trature. 
I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly. Um, but anyway, I guess my conclusion is, is that we're still a ways off. Um, this is just my interpretation of the specification, so I hope everything is accurate here, but um, don't hold me to it. Again, kind of taking different interpreters, splicing them together, and filling in the gaps with the September revision. Thank you.